How come we only remember the great champions in wrestling history, but never talk about the lovable losers who hardly ever came close to capturing a title, let alone picking up a dub? Known in the business as enhancement talent, these poor dudes made a career out of doing nothing but making everyone else look like superstars. Now it's a thankless job that somebody's gotta do. However, on occasion, at least from a entrance music standpoint, some of these simps were surprisingly shown some love. That being said, I'm Kevin Callis, this is Wrestling behind the themes and here are 10 WWE jobbers who actually had entrance theme music. A pasty looking dweeb of a man, Dwayne Gill somehow managed to parlay his work as enhancement talent into an entertaining parody act that is still recognizable today. Appearing in the early 1990s as a regular jobber on weekly WWF programs like Wrestling Challenge and Superstars, Gill rarely had success, but he kept getting up and coming back for more. Then, out of nowhere, on a November 1998 episode of Monday Night Raw, Dwayne showed up for work, came out to this giddy theme music, and shocked the world with with a little help from his buddies in the job squad when he pinned Christian and won the WWE Light Heavyweight Championship. However, what came next was truly lightning in a bottle. Gilberg. Gilberg. Gilberg, a comedic jab at WCW ass kicker Goldberg, got over with fans so much so that Gil became the longest reigning light heavyweight champion in WWE history. Now the only downside to Dwayne becoming Gilberg was that he stopped using this Brian Zane certified 1980s sitcom slapper of a theme. Start spreading the news that though the slovenly superstar may not have had the most impressive win-loss record, the Brooklyn brawler Steve Lombardi wasn't just some bum off the streets of New York City. His longevity as a loser endeared him to generations of wrestling fans because the journeyman jobber was also one of the WWE's most versatile performers ever. In addition to playing his regular role as the brawler, Lombardi wore additional masks and plenty of face paints over his career. As Kimchi, the handler for Kamala the Ugandan giant, Abe Knuckleball Schwartz, a disgruntled former baseball player, and he even donned the clown suit of Doink every so often. Dependable and trustworthy, Brawler got probably the biggest push out of every ham and egger on this list, and wound up amassing a grand total of five different entrance theme songs from the year 2000 through 2006. Leaping Lanny Poffo might be the most famous of all jobbers on this list, and I know what you're thinking, it's not because of his special talent, if you know what I mean. And if you don't know what I mean, then just type Lanny Poffo party trick into your Google machine and see what happens. The brother of the late macho man Randy Savage, Leaping Lanny was actually a notch above other jobbers, and also got some time on the stick, no pun intended, to recite his clever wrestling related poetry. However, Poffo would eventually turn heel and became known as the genius, adopting a highly intelligent and better than you persona. Now Lanny would continue to wrestle off and on, but was now primarily a manager first for Mr. Perfect and then for the Beverly Brothers, a tag team of siblings who looked nothing alike except for their starry purple tights and flowing blonde mullets. But Poffo did get the chance to prance down the aisle to this early 90s department store slapper. Before coming into his own as just incredible in ECW, the real-life Peter Polacco spent nearly two years in the WWF as enhancement talent until Pat Patterson hired him to a full-time contract in late 1994. Given his Portuguese heritage, Polacco was initially given the gimmick of a soccer player named Aldo Montoya. However, because Polacco didn't like soccer, the idea was scrapped and changed to the Portuguese Man-O-War character that 
strapped poor Montoya in some hideous ring gear, which looked like he was wearing an athletic supporter over his face with holes cut out all over for other various orifices. Now, the Fed pushed Aldo to the moon for about five minutes until he became the butt of many jokes, including the title of his entrance theme song called What a Jock. Getting over in one federation does not always mean that you'll get over in another. And the late Tracy Smothers is a prime example of a man who got the rub in one place, but not exactly the other. In the early 1990s, Smothers was a beloved babyface in Jim Cornette's Smoky Mountain Wrestling, who got all the glorious gymnasium pops throughout Kentucky, Tennessee, and the rest of Appalachia. However, when Smoky Mountain shut down and Cornette's wrestlers lost their jobs, some of their talent had to resort to become jabroni jobbers in the WWF. And that's exactly what happened to Tracy as he became Freddy Joe Floyd, whose name was a rib on front office officials Freddy Joe and Gerald Floyd Briscoe. And in keeping with Vince McMahon's fondness for ridiculing wild-eyed southern boys, Smothers was given this down-home entrance theme called Bowleg Cowboy that would never ever be classified as what you'd call a hillbilly hit. Now, what could possibly be worse than Freddy Joe? Well, three frat dudes in sweater vests and khakis, of course. Looking like the Shield went shopping at Old Navy, the Mean Street Posse of Pete Gass, Rodney, and Joey Abs were real-life bros of Shane McMahon, except for Abs, and who grew up on the mean streets of Greenwich, Connecticut, which is known for its crime-infested, expensive high-end boutiques and drug-riddled hedge fund offices. Now, these preppy thugs were one of the most annoying, yet were the stables of the Attitude Era, who turned what was just supposed to be a one-off appearance into a memorable WWE run. And you can't help but groove to their porno-like theme music called Posse, which for a trio of jobbers was pretty damn catchy. What started out to be just a one-time pairing, the team of Jim Powers and Paul Roma rose to prominence for a cup of coffee during the late 1980s. First referred to as a couple of young stallions on color commentary by the ever so eloquent living legend Bruno Sammartino, the name stuck, and these two studs were off to the races. Having some early success, the stallions embarked on one of the only storyline feuds that I can recall in wrestling history centered around a song and who could use that specific music as their entrance theme. From Pile Driver, crank it up in terms of pure musical quality is one of Jimmy Hart's best songs ever. I mean, I used to crank the shib out of this banger back in the day on my Walkman. Before Maxwell Jacob Friedman was the king of the Jewish wrestlers, Barry Horowitz was the not-so-bright shining star of David, the pure personification of the word jobber. Horowitz was infamous for his self-congratulatory pat on the back before his matches. And even though, over his career, Horowitz would amass a lengthy losing streak as long as the Mississippi, in the mid-90s, he actually found success when he pulled off an upset win over Skip of the Body Donnas, complete with good old JR's call of Horowitz wins, Horowitz wins. This dub led to somewhat of a tiny babyface push for Barry, and he even got this midi mid version version of Hava Nagila, the celebratory Jewish folk song for entrance music. But unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, and Barry would soon return to counting the ring lights on a regular basis. Tiny kangaroo down, sport. Tiny kangaroo down. Tiny kangaroo down, sport. Tiny kangaroo down. If you grew up in the 80s, then I don't need to explain to you the cultural phenomenon that occurred when the movie Crocodile Dundee hit the big screen. But for the benefit of you who aren't boomers, let's take a walkabout down memory lane, shall we? Australian love swept across the globe and even into the WWF, where Vince McMahon tried to make his own version of Mick Dundee in the form of one Outback Jack. 
who was hardly a thunder from down under. Instead, Jack spent most of his days having a look at the lights while flat on his back. But no worries, mate, because whenever he'd make his way down to ringside, he'd enter to the catchy song of Tie Me Kangaroo Down Sport, which no cap is probably one of the worst themes in history. To say that the chinless wonder is an oddly shaped man would be putting it lightly. And speaking of light, at 5'7 and probably a buck 75 soaking wet, Ellsworth doesn't exactly invoke fear in the eyes of his opponents. However, the Baltimore, Maryland native somehow embarked on one of the most baffling WWE runs in recent memory. In this day and age, he was kind of the perfect jobber. An everyman standing across the ring from superhumans like Braun Strowman. And for whatever reason, the WWE Universe found his meek appearance and personality endearing. Now he lasted with the company two years longer than probably anyone thought, and even got this crunchy entrance music, which is just as generic sounding as all the other heavy themes, but it's buoyed by the fact that it's associated with such a lovable, wormy little dork. 